My friend Harry. Our next report is on a man who's just that, a friend, a good friend of Connecticut Journal's Frank Boris. Here's his story. Countless people pass through our daily lives, the vast majority of whom we know nothing about. A blur of strangers that whisk through our subconscious, too fleeting to imprint on our minds. Occasionally, somehow, an individual will make an impression. Maybe you pause by a photo in a newspaper. It reveals a familiar face. In this case, for me, it's Harry Weitzel and some children from his grassroots tennis program. There's more behind a photograph and captions. Much more. I've known Harry for about 13 years now. He's an unassuming American active in his community. Harry will tell you he's a very typical guy. But I'm not too sure of that. Harry's story begins thousands of miles away in a dream world of nightmares, a world of mindless atrocities. But first, the calm before the storm. In 1932, the Germany between world wars was austere with rumblings of the chaos to come. In this setting, Fritz and Flori Kutsch were married and later brought little Helmut into the world. For three years, Helmut Kutsch treasured the security of loving parents and Vetter, his rural hometown. Well, my first memories of my childhood in Germany are very pleasant. They're of uh, trips into the forest with my grandparents, my uncle, picking berries. German woods were beautiful. Uh, spending uh, time on my grandfather's lap when he played cards. Our walks to the synagogue on Saturday, Saturday mornings. Helmut's world, however, would crash down upon him in 1936. Since he had a Christian father and a Jewish mother, new anti-Jewish laws prohibiting interracial marriages ripped his family apart. But then the Nazis got stronger and stronger. We went in a restaurant, or it was an evening from the community dance. They said, you, Fritz, you can stay here. Flory got to get out. And so the fights began. Flory hid in Frankfurt while Helmut stayed with his Jewish grandparents. But tensions turned to fear on Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass, when Jewish communities were terrorized. In the middle of the night, rocks started coming through the windows of our house, my grandparents' house. And my grandma put me under this down in the bed to protect me. And uh, my grandfather started to go downstairs, and someone smashed in the front door and threatened him. I called my parents, and the phone was cut off. So I tried to go to my parents and Harry. Eventually, Flory returned for Helmut and took him to a nearby orphanage in Frankfurt. My first day walking to this Jewish school, where a bunch of uniformed uh, German kids. Hitler Youth? Hitler Youth, right. Mm -hmm. uh, started chasing us. Of course, I didn't know why my friends were running. And uh, got into my first real fight. Flory was determined to escape with her son, but not before making one last visit. We didn't know what would happen, but we did go to, back to Marburg to say goodbye to my grandparents and to uh, some cousins and uncles of my mom, aunts and uncles, with the realization that, uh, at least my mother had the realization that she might never see them again. Since Helmut's father was Christian, Flory and her son escaped arrest and were able to get visas and a reservation on a refugee train. They prayed the train would not be rerouted as they traveled through war-torn France, a civil war devastated Spain, and on to Portugal. Every night we had to go in the air with shelter. Then the English bombing came and the Germans went to England. As long as I was with my mom, I had no, you know, that was my security. That was her skirt I hung on to. In retrospect, when you think of your mother through that time, through that period, uh, what do you think of her character? Mm, she's a pretty tough lady. 
<clears throat> in Lisbon, a boat called the Mocino held the promise of freedom for the few who would board her. Helmut and his mother were among the fortunate. Once we got on a boat and we got out to sea, then the next thing I knew, everybody was afraid that we were going to get torpedoed. It had taken a month to escape Germany and a week on the boat before reaching New York Harbor. Yeah, there was my uncle waiting for us in his American soldier's uniform. And uh, there were newspaper people. I guess we were celebrities from the time we uh, landed on these shores because American soldier greets refugee sister and nephew was kind of big news because America was gearing up for the war. I didn't recognize it. I didn't expect to see a soldier, my brother. This was something. When he said, Flory, what is mine is yours. He had nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so you had nothing, too? <laughs> he had nothing. <laughs> and we had nothing. <laughs> nothing from nothing, left nothing. The man that was to become my stepfather, who adopted me, um, had seen our picture in the papers and had known my mom and had courted her a little bit in Frankfurt. Uh, immediately contacted her, courted her, and there were two lonely people in a strange country speaking the la same language, trying to establish something, and they very quickly decided to get married and uh, make a home for themselves and for me. That home was Bridgeport, Connecticut. In the 1940s, it was the arsenal of democracy, a city at the height of manufacturing, as well as paranoia. German Jews like Ernie Weitzel were not allowed to work in defense plants. So in the age of the Eggman and the Milkman, the Weitzels survived by starting a unique company selling women's cosmetics and fashions door to door. Helmut eventually changed his name to Harry Weitzel. But the Americanization of his first name didn't stop the discrimination he'd first witnessed in Europe. Now, instead of being terrorized for being a Jew in Germany, Harry was called a Nazi by fellow American students. At his bar mitzvah, Harry prayed for hate to end and for the survival of European relatives. But soon he would learn that his grandparents and most of the family died in a place called Theresienstadt. We were German, our parents, our uncle, our First World War, my uncle, Uncle Herman, had an iron cross. He got killed, his wife, the oldest boy with his wife, and two girls, two daughters. My cousin Max and wife is two girls. My youngest cousin, Betty, was 20. They all got exterminated. The whole family. As young boys often did, Harry found refuge in sports. Uh, Siggy Weichsel uh, gave me a tennis racket and took me against the wall and said, here's how you hit a tennis ball. Old wooden Wilson, I think it was. And uh, I'll always be indebted to Uncle Siggy because tennis sub subsequently became a very integral part of my life and my escape from reality once in a while. He continued to play tennis while in the military in Huntsville, Alabama. He also met a Southern Belle. Soon he married the beauty queen. They started a family, returned to Bridgeport, and tripled the family business. Had my convertibles and my Cadillac and my beautiful wife and lovely children and was living the American dream. And uh, subsequently, uh, my mom has a saying, wer nicht wagt, der nicht gewinnt, which means if you don't take a chance once in a while, you can't win. Well, I probably took one chance too many and I lost. And uh, went through some down times uh, financially, but I don't think I was ever, I never felt myself counted out. And I think that comes from the years of having to fight adversity. Harry totally assimilated into American culture by divorcing, remarrying, and starting again. Harry's entrepreneurship endeared him to the Bridgeport community. So in 1989, when the financially strapped city dropped the ball on its youth recreation programs, Harry created Grassroots Tennis, 
turning his childhood love for the game into a tennis camp for inner city kids. I relate very much to the identity, the, the feelings that come with being a minority, the sense of being a second-class citizen, so to speak. I wanted to transmit to these kids in some way through a sport that I loved, and I thought I uh, had a lot of intrinsic value, the sport of tennis, uh, that if I could bring this to them and uh, give them some sense of self-respect and sense of self and keep them off the boob tube during the summertime, it would be fun and fulfilling to me, and I thought I could, as they say, give something back. Today, thousands of children, mostly minorities in eight cities throughout Connecticut, are involved in grassroots tennis, the largest program of its kind in the state. Seven years ago, Weitzel returned to Vetter, Germany, where he spoke at a ceremony from his unique perspective of being both Christian and Jewish. I think you have to address the past. You have to address where you came from and uh, whether the feelings, conscious or subconscious, are valid. Weitzel says he's longing to somehow validate his faith in the intrinsic goodness of man. I really feel that uh, too much, so much of the anger and the bitterness and the hatred that goes on throughout the world, whether it's in Ireland, whether it's in Palestine, whether it's in Africa, wherever, Kosovo, is a continuum of hatreds from generation to generation to generation. Today, Weitzel is a vice president of Coldwell Banker Commercial Real Estate in Westport. He's the chairman of both Grassroots Tennis and the Jewish Community Center Holocaust Committees in Bridgeport. Deep down, scars remain, but his exuberance for life has overcome much of the past. His children are successful in their lives, and his grandchildren bring him joy beyond description. To many, including himself, he's your average American guy. There is, however, nothing average about my friend Harry. And that's it for this edition of Connecticut Journal. Next week, a look at filmmakers and photographers featuring the latest photo exhibition by the late Linda McCartney, currently on display at the New Britain Museum of American Art.